My name is Tony Juniper. I'm an environmentalist and I work for WWF. Our mission is to protect and restore our planet's incredible web of life, to halt and reverse the decline of disappearing animals and plants, and to find ways whereby people and the rest of nature can thrive together forever. If you think about that mission for a moment, where might we put ourselves? What might our priorities be? You might think that it's the flow of plastic into the ocean that we have to halt immediately. You might think we have to do something about our consumerist culture to stop the demand for natural resources becoming utterly unsustainable. Perhaps it's something about our insatiable demand for energy and being able to do something to make that more efficient and cleaner. Or perhaps it's something about the illegal wildlife trade and the brutal effects on animals from tigers to elephants and many more besides. Well, at WWF, all of those things are part of what we're trying to do. But our research has recently discovered that there's an even bigger priority that we must address. And namely, that is the effects of our food system and the way in which we feed ourselves. In October 2018, WWF published the most recent iteration of its Living Planet Report. This is a periodic stock take of the populations of animals across the world. We look at thousands of different species, thousands of different data sets. And our most recent survey shows how between 1970 and the present time, the decline of vertebrate populations across the world has been 60%. 60% fewer birds, mammals, reptiles, and fish compared with the situation less than a human lifetime ago. This is a huge, rapid, and profound change in conditions in life on Earth. And we discovered that the principal reason for that rapid decline is the way in which we're feeding the global population. And not only did we find that about 60% of the decline can be explained by agriculture and food consumption patterns in different ways, but in addition to all of that, at least a quarter of the greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are arising from the same thing, the way in which we're providing food for everybody. The ways in which these impacts pan out, they are many and varied, as you might expect. One big one is linked with the conversion of land from natural and semi-natural habitats to be cleared away to make place uh, for crops and for pasture. And across the globe, this continues apace, especially in the tropical countries. Across the tropical regions of the Earth, where the remaining forests and savannas meet the agricultural frontier, each year we're losing an area of natural habitat equivalent to England, about 150,000 square kilometers per year. And when that land is cleared, there is a tendency over time for the agriculture to become more and more intensive. And if you look at the situation in Western Europe, where the land was mostly cleared many centuries ago, you can see what this means in practice. Even though we had, until quite recently, rich wildlife living in the countryside across northwestern Europe, there's been a rapid decline. This has been linked to the clearance of small farms to be replaced by bigger ones, the loss of semi-natural habitats, of woodlands, of grasslands, of ponds, and of uh, areas of, of meadow, to be replaced with ever more intensively managed monocultures. Look out of the train window as you're driving through the countryside. Big fields and not much other life except the crops. And a situation that's been considerably uh, worsened from the point of view of wildlife by the liberal application of herbicides and pesticides. The State of Nature report published a couple of years ago by Britain's leading environmental groups tells us that the long-term decline of wildlife in this country continues apace. More than 50% of species studied, several thousand of them, going down in a way which looks like at least one in seven will disappear from these islands for good in the near future. One profound consequence of that industrial-scale farming that's leading to that wildlife loss is the use of very large quantities of industrial fertilizers. Nitrogen is building up in the environment in ways that are causing really profound impacts. Indeed, if you look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
since pre-industrial times, it's gone up by about 40%. If you look at the plant available nitrogen, however, that's nearly doubled in concentration globally, escaping from fields. As we put fertilizers down, the soil being washed away, the fertilizers going into rivers, causing algal blooms, choking the water courses, leading to big impacts on wildlife. And then those fertilizers make it to coastal waters, where in the worst cases, so-called dead zones emerge. Dead zones are where the oxygen is sucked out of the coastal water, causing the death of fish and other higher animals, again, directly linked to how we're producing food. And of course, the impact of our food system on the marine environment is not only seen in the form of escaping fertilizers, it's also seen in the impacts that come with how we extract seafood. Many areas of seabed habitat have been damaged or destroyed by bottom trawling gear going across the seabed to catch fish. And of course, there is the bycatch of many endangered animals caught on fishing gear inadvertently, leading to population declines amongst endangered albatrosses, turtles, dolphins, and others. So we can see a wide range of very large-scale impacts driving down populations of wildlife. The thing is, we've known about this really for quite some time. And the big question is, why do we continue with this particular direction of travel? Well, it seems we've become very used to the idea of having to produce more and more food. A rising population is part of that. And also, to keep prices low, we have to create an abundance of food. That's the mentality. And in that mentality, we've chucked every technological trick at agriculture. And as we've done that, we've seen the clearance of land as inevitable, the decline of wildlife as regrettable. But nonetheless, we've continued in that same direction. It's important to pause, however, because this line of thinking has some grave dangers embedded within it. And those dangers are not only seen from the point of view of wildlife, but also from the point of view of agriculture. After all, try and think of an economic sector that sustains our civilization that is more dependent on a healthy environment than farming. Everything we need from farming is about a healthy environment. And the more we degrade the environment, the more, long term, we imperil the future of farming. That's quite a thought when you think about it, but it seems that we very rarely do. Take the question of soil, that dark world beneath our feet to which we hardly ever pay a second thought. For many of us, it's got the cultural label of dirt, a derogatory word, something to be kept away, something to be washed off, in fact, the soil is alive. It's one of the most complex ecosystems on planet Earth. If you go to a healthy area of pasture around here, take a tablespoon of soil, go to a laboratory, put that sample underneath an electron microscope, and start counting the life forms in there, you will get to something like six billion individual microorganisms in that tiny egg-sized sample. Bacteria, actinobacteria, fungal filaments, viruses, nematodes. Occasionally, you'll find a huge big animal in there, an earthworm. And all of these things are interacting in ways that we barely understand. In that soil sample, we might find 20,000 different species of organism. An incredible diversity. And what that soil is doing, and that crucial living part, it's recycling nutrients. That's what it's doing. Plant material coming from above, fixed by photosynthesis, falling to the ground surface, being taken underground, including by the earthworms, broken down to release the nutrients once more into the uh, soil to enable plant growth. And that organic matter, that living fraction, the microorganisms and the plant material coming in, that's the organic matter. It's vital for the functioning of life on land. And that organic matter is not only enabling the recycling of nutrients, it holds a lot of water. If you have high organic content in the soil, it holds a lot more water, making crops resilient to drought, amongst other things. And yet, this intricate living system, we abuse it 
in ways that are leading to really quite drastic changes. Across the world, about one third of agricultural soils are now regarded as acutely degraded, eroded, compacted, and their organic matter significantly reduced. And the only way they continue to produce food is because we apply lots of nitrogen fertilizer. We're masking the loss of soil health with industrial quantities of chemicals. And as we're degrading the soil on a global scale, bear in mind that this continues at an accelerating pace. Something like 24 billion tons of topsoil being lost every year, most of it going to the sea, carrying chemicals, pesticides, and fertilizers with it. This is not sustainable. And then take the loss of life on the land around those agricultural landscapes, including the decline of pollinators. Some scientists now are describing what they call an insect Armageddon taking place across our planet. In the fields around here, to the jungles of Costa Rica, to the croplands of Central Europe, insect populations are in free fall. There's a debate going on as to why this might be the case. It's probably a combination of factors. That shift to monocultures, the use of insecticides, climate change on top of that, all of these things combining to see the decline of bees, butterflies, beetles, moths, and others, all animals that are vital to the functioning of the ecosystem, and not only for pollination, of course. If you're a bat or a bird, these are vital food sources. And if you're wondering about the future of vertebrate animals that live on insects, well, actually, this obviously is a major threat. So the soil and the pollinators are vital for food production. And so, of course, is this stuff, fresh water. Our planet has a tiny quantity of this compared to the overall quantity of water. Most of it's in the sea, salt water. The water that's available for plant life and for animal life, it's being recycled. Animal life and plant life on land is being recycled by ecosystems. We may think water comes out of taps or out of bottles increasingly. Actually, the water is coming out of forests, amongst other systems. Tropical rainforests, for example, are pumping billions of tons of water into the atmosphere every day from the underside of their leaves, tiny pores. The water's flowing out in vapor into the air, and it's traveling, sometimes thousands of miles in so-called sky rivers, to water crops far distant from where the forest stood, or where the forests once stood. So the more we're clearing those ecosystems, then the more we're going to imperil water supply into the future. And at the same time, bear in mind the water security issue becomes more acute as we degrade soil health. If soils have got less organic matter and there's a drought, the water that is falling will not be held in the ground. This is going to affect food yields going forward. And as we're thinking about the importance of forests and soils for water, let's just dwell for a second on the fact that those two systems hold billions of tons of carbon in the trees and beneath the ground. And so long as that carbon is being held in those natural systems, then it's out of the atmosphere. And the more we damage those systems, the more we're pumping carbon into the air to warm our planet. That, in turn, is going to imperil food production because of the way in which the extreme weather events and changes to seasonal patterns will disrupt agriculture, amongst many other sectors. So what are we going to do about this? Uh, and again, our journey of discovery as environmentalists is leading us to some conclusions, some of which you may have heard of. So the first thing we all might do as consumers is to reduce our meat and dairy consumption. The impact of an animal livestock-based diet compared to a plant-based one is much bigger in terms of land, water, and also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Would you believe that something like 40% of the crops we're growing globally, we're feeding to animals, mostly in cages, in industrial livestock facilities, so-called factory farms, to be able to produce cheap meat? If you look at the wider environmental effects, it's actually not that cheap. But in terms of what we're trying to do in keeping prices low, is courting a range of big environmental impacts that come with an increase in demand for those foods. And you can see the effects of this in other, among other places, 
the Cerrado savannas of central Brazil were working very hard to try and find solutions to the clearance of those ecosystems. But the big cause is the extraction of more and more soya beans from those landscapes in order to put into global supply chains for meat and dairy foods. That deforestation can be halted if only there were different approaches towards agriculture and it would make a difference if there was a lowered demand for meat and dairy products. Indeed, one statistic comes from a piece of work that estimates that if the world's top two billion consumers of meat and dairy were to cut their consumption by 40%, so 40% less meat and dairy, that alone would free up an area of land twice the size of India. This is an incredible impact being created by a dietary trend which has really gathered pace during recent years. And so we also need to be looking towards the question of food waste and the extent to which we can be eliminating the one third of food that's going into bins. And we can be thinking about the ways in which we can speak to consumer goods companies and supermarkets to be sourcing food for us in ways that's avoiding deforestation. We know that companies can do this. They are already investing in supply chains with stronger environmental credentials. And while we're asking them to avoid deforestation, we can ask them to supply sustainable seafood as well. And as voters, we're very powerful in encouraging ministers to move towards different kinds of agricultural policies, as we are beginning to do in this country right now. Public money for public goods is the new mantra, helping farmers to go in the right direction by paying them for improving soil health, improving wildlife populations, and cleaning up our rivers. It can be done. This is really about all of us in the end, as consumers, as people who make personal choices, and as voters, we can insist on a different outcome for our future, for all of life on Earth. Because as we discover the problems, so we're also discovering the solutions. And on the journey towards embracing those solutions, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all bon appetit. Thank you.